you. Yes, sir. Um, first, thank you so much for coming to our community. Thank, thank you for your status. It's, it's very wonderful. Thank you, too, for the College of Black Brockport and the Mallet family. Um, it's a really, really wonderful thing. Um, my question is, I'd like your response to what you think Saudi Arabia could do even more for what seems to be a crisis in Islam. My name's Frank Howard. I'm a local attorney. I'm also director of uh, White Lotus Buddhist Center here in Rochester. I've had the fortunate occasion to do, to meet dozens of Muslims through interfaith work. And I have to tell you that I have yet to meet one person who doesn't reflect a certain kind of quiet dignity and, in my estimation, a very strong uh, individual moral <coughs> ethic. So I have a great respect for Islam. At the same time, it's so disturbing that those men that flew those planes into our buildings were praying as they were doing to that. Now I know this is perhaps a small percentage, and I don't believe that it's a problem with <coughs> Islam per se, but at the same time, it seems that this is something that can only be corrected by the Islamic world itself. Um, and too often there seems to be kind of a knee-jerk reaction, I think, that prevents people from actually having a dialogue about it, saying, well, they misunderstand Islam. It may be true, I don't know, I'm not Muslim, but at the same time, they seem to be able to support their positions, their extreme positions, in Islamic texts. And so it seems to me that it's, I was encouraged to hear what you have said about what has happened over the years, right back at the beginning of the founding of the Saudi Arabian Kingdom, because of the special position that Arabia has, Saudi Arabia has in Islam. So I'm wondering if you think there could be more done from the Islamic side and, and what that would be. As I said in my presentation, particularly on the kingdom's part, uh, not only the, uh, the rehabilitation program that, that was inaugurated in the kingdom after September 11th, uh, but even uh, more recently and, and I think more, more uh, dramatically, if you like, uh, the king's uh, call for dialogue between religions and, and cultures, which he took from stage to stage, first collecting a unified Muslim position, then going on to meet with <coughs> religious leaders in Madrid uh, in uh, July 2008 and in November 2008 on to the General Assembly. And as I said also, the recent inauguration of the Secretariat General of that uh, effort uh, has been established in Vienna. Uh, these are very direct and very uh, action-oriented uh, uh, decisions that were taken by, by the king. And I would agree with you that, uh, as I also mentioned in my presentation, uh, that there are those who try to use religion for whatever purpose, some of them for political purposes, others who use it for financial gain or whatever. Uh, and alas, and, and when we look at human history and go back to, to, to previous uh, events that afflicted uh, conflicts between peoples uh, and religions, we see similar use of religion as a means to achieve either territorial gain or, or political, uh, political acquisition. Uh, look at the Crusades, for example, uh, when Christian soldiers marched from Europe all the way across into, into the Middle East, and uh, in, in, in the process, not only destroying uh, Muslims and so on, but they also happened to pass by other Christians who did not follow the same sect and were equally treated badly by those, uh, those Christians. So it takes a communal effort, and I think it takes a global effort. And this is what uh, King Abdullah has, uh, has tried uh, to do. Uh, and if you look at this community, I'm sure you will see that the efforts of people like Professor Malik and his, his cohorts uh, at the university are a wonderful example of what Muslims can do to overcome the challenges that face them in these very hard and, and very disquieting uh, times when we see accusation and counter accusation between peoples on issues that should not be uh, a cause for, for, for difference, but rather, as I said, that we have more in common than, than divides us. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you, Mayor, for the weather. <laughs> well done. I'm Dr. Wakefield. I teach in the History Department at Brockport. And I've had, uh, I have a friend who, um, she attended university in Saudi Arabia and had a wonderful experience. I had a friend who went on the Hajj and who found it to be a moving and important faith moment for her. Um, neither of those women were Saudi citizens. Um, and I'm curious, I've, I've been thinking about what you said about uh, King Abdullah's commitment to allowing women to participate in the political process. Right. But I wonder how that can really be affected if women in Saudi Arabia are still not free to go out and about by themselves without escort, um, when they are not free to travel um, outside of the kingdom without an escort uh, or permission. Uh, you know, I, I think that it is, a, it is quite a remarkable um, opportunity for Saudi women to be able to participate politically. But I wonder how effective their voices will be if they are not able to go out and about and make those decisions based on their experiences. Well, let me say, Annie, uh, the kingdom, in as much as the king has set these reforms in motion, uh, the society in the kingdom has uh, differing views of where they want to go. Uh, you will find many Saudis who support the king, uh, some who disagree uh, and would vocally express their, their, their disagreement. But nonetheless, the, the position of the king and the government is that we're going forward with these reforms. And when it comes to women's rights, uh, giving them the, the right to vote and uh, the right to be members of, of the Shura <coughs> Council, says nothing about how uh, their voting is to be directed by their men vote, uh, or the, 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 the membership in, in, in the Shura Council should come only with agreement or with permission from, from their men. It's an open-ended uh, integration of women in the collective process of electioneering and representing uh, Saudi society in, in the parliament. And that's just one example. I know that uh, if I were to tell you stories about women and men in Saudi Arabia, I may be thought to be propagandizing for my country. But we've just had a recent visit by Ms. Nadia Malik to, to, uh, to, to, to the kingdom, and I'm sure you should ask her one day to talk to you about her experience. Uh, one thing that, that I know is that uh, my wife and children don't need my, my permission to go anywhere. They don't need my company to go anywhere, either inside or outside the country. And I think a lot of the Saudis here would agree with that proposition. I'm sure some of them would disagree. But that's the, the, the value of having the national dialogue in the kingdom, is to get people together so that issues like that can be openly discussed and uh, brought to the, to the attention of, of people and uh, valuable knowledge and, uh, and uh, experience can be shared by them. I see many of my Saudi uh, student friends uh, up there in the audience, uh, and I'm sure many of them have differing views over what I said. But nonetheless, I mean, the fact that we are in the kingdom engaged in this process of moving forward will entail opposition, and it will entail sometimes even conflict, as we saw in the occupation of the mosque in 1979. As it does in every society. Well, perhaps, but I'm talking about Saudi society. So I would say that yeah, we are moving forward. And uh, we don't, I, I don't think I, I would like to see uh, our women have to go through uh, the process of, of protest and even giving their lives up that your women in America had to go through when they got the electoral uh, process uh, agreed for them. If you go back to the Parkinson lady, and, 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 and I hope I'm quoting the name correctly, uh, and, and others in the past who had to give up their lives simply to acquire the right to, to vote and so on. 
I'm glad to see that it was our king who took the first step in, in, in allowing that to happen. Thank you. If I, if I may add to that, I think sometimes we forget from a Western-centric point of view that we've really, in this country, only had the right to vote for 91 years. Um, it's a process, it takes time. I think the women's movement in this country really peaked in the 60s and the 70s. And as Princess Amira so graceful, uh, graciously said at CGI, I think Saudi Arabia is a unique example, uh, separate from uh, many of the other countries that have gone through some change in the past few months. Um, the love of the royal family and the process and the, the, the national pride that I saw in Saudi Arabia I have yet to see in another Muslim country. There's so much pride in being a Saudi, and I think the process of change is more, um, as Princess Amira said, evolution, not revolution, and it just takes time.